So um, this is an incredibly important topic um, having to do with the, the military and, and uh, the global, global military and security. And um, I was talking to Jeff on the way here that one of the huge problems is how segmented everything is, you know, that, that um, activists are, are separate from um, researchers and academics and academic departments don't communicate with each other and there's, you know, and, and it's a huge problem and I, and I think that that was one of the really exceptional things about having Jeff and, and Bruce here because they're both extraordinary researchers but also extraordinary activists. Um, they've both been involved with with their work around social justice and the military for, for decades and uh, combine that ability to have, you know, an extraordinary um, conceptual um, ability to, you know, to, to frame and, and to research what they're doing, but are also very connected with people on the ground. And uh, that comes out in all their work. Um, Bruce is, is connected with, is the director and founder of the Global Network against weapons and nuclear power in space, and his, his uh, website is really extraordinary. Jeff was the director and founder of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, and he has moved into the uh, connected area of really looking at, at military and security. Um, a number of, Jeff has been in, in Canada a number of times, and, and a number of years ago, in one of his talks, he talked about the importance of, of the military and, and Israel, and, and the fact that Israel is, is not a victim, that it has a very powerful military. And it's, uh, it's something that's been very hard to catch on. I'm, I'm um, also a member of, of a, a, um, Independent Jewish Voices, and it took a number of years before people were willing to, to focus on that, you know, just the military aspect. So there's a huge, resistance for, for, you know, it's hard to know why, but to really looking at the, the power and the expansion of the military um, that, you know, certainly is taking place before our eyes, you know, and um, I often come back to thinking about, you know, in the early 90s, there was a chance of abolishing nuclear weapons. There was also a chance of, of really turning uh, turning the, the world around, around uh, the use of fossil fuels, everything was known then. You know, James Hansen had testified to Congress in uh, 1989. But everything went really in a very different direction, and now we're faced with, you know, the possibility, of, again, of, of nuclear war, um, a huge, huge um, uh, Obama um, allocating 1.1 trillion dollars to upgrade nuclear weapons over the next three decades, and um, as you'll see in the brief film that from Bruce Gagnon, the surrounding of of, um, of Russia and the encirclement of Russia and, and China, you know, by by NATO bases and so on. Anyway, uh, I will cut short my, my brief introduction. I do want to mention my own special um, interest, which has been climate change, climate justice. And again, the connection with the military. In 2009, Sarah Flounders from the International Action Center wrote a really brilliant article that was one of the most, it was the prize most censored story of that year. It was about the Copenhagen climate meetings in which she talked about the military being neglected by the 15,000 delegates by the, I guess, 130 nations that were represented there and 100,000 um, demonstrators, demonstrators in the streets um, neglected to talk about the military and its connection with climate change, even though the military is the largest single emitter of greenhouse gas emissions and will not be affected by renewables and it has a blanket exemption under the Kyoto Protocol, so none of those emissions are counted. Just to bring you up to date, there's still not, still not, um, uh, still not a focus. It wasn't a focus in Naomi Klein's book. I mean, she didn't even mention it, really. It's not a focus of 350.org, again, not mentioned, or Greenpeace and, and a number of other, you know, uh, environmental organizations. And the latest, um, you know, showing again the, the inter, interface between so many areas that are of great concern now, the, you know, the militarization, nuclear weapons, climate change, 
and you know incredible global um, poverty is that in the Cancun climate meetings, they were supposed to allocate $100 billion a year by 2020 for, for the periphery countries, for the people who, you know, who are suffering most from climate change and who didn't cause it. So far, very little of that money has been collected. This is for, you know, for 2020. And the latest, the latest um, iteration of that is that um, ODA, um, Overseas Development Assistance, um, ha has been counted as part of those adaptation funds. So countries don't have to contribute extra, you know, for climate adaptation. They can, and they can count it as their overseas development foreign aid. Plus, they're saying that peacekeeping and security can be counted. <laughs> so essentially, you know, in, uh, you know, military sales are booming in the, in the, um, uh, you know, previously entitled titled uh, third world, um, as uh, as well as debt, and uh, then of course you get all the structural adjustment programs and stuff like that. So all this is going to be counted as adaptation funds, you know, to essentially, you know, keep keep dictators in power and and you know, and again severely threaten the lives of of um, people all over and. Uh, uh, the other thing that I, I think I would mention in 2009, that Oxfam and the Global um, Humanitarian Forum um, under Kofi Annan were already saying that 300,000 people a year were dying from climate change. So, you know, the m m mortality rate from war, from climate change, you know, is, is, uh, is really utterly neglected. So with that, I'd like to introduce Jeff. <laughs> no. Yeah, so let me tell you about my work, and and, and uh, then we'll have time for questions, discussions, arguments, whatever we want. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I start my book, actually. Uh, you know, I've been involved as an activist <coughs> on the Israel-Palestine issue for many, many years, especially as the head of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. I live in Israel. I actually don't have to tell you, I know everybody in the audience. What am I? It's not like I'm a, a stranger or something. Um, and uh, a question that was nagging at the back of my mind all these years has been, how does Israel get away with this? Which is the question that I begin the book with. You know, we're 70 years or more after the colonial era. I mean, we're not conquering territories anymore and having Western populations uh, dominate and rule the natives. Uh, we're, um, you know, I think issue, you know, human rights, international law have developed greatly over the last half century and have penetrated the, the consciousness of people. They're a part of the discourse today. No country really wants to be seen as a violator of human rights. Um, this is a conflict happening on the southern border of Europe, in the Holy Land, no less, so you know, that should be something of concern to, to religious people. And, uh, and of course, this is one of the, probably the, this is probably the most covered, uh, researched, documented conflict in history. But it's not happening in the Congo, and it's not happening in, uh, in the jungles of Vietnam, and it's not happening in, 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 in Mexico. It's happening as, it's a transparent conflict you know, that's on the TV every, on TV every day. And yet, for all of that, Israel is doing fine. Not only, and that's another lecture I won't get into tonight, not only maintaining the occupation, but actually creating an apartheid regime. Um, I would argue that uh, there is no more occupation. There is no more West Bank. It has been Judaized. And it is today the Judea and Samaria, with a few Arab uh, enclaves in areas A and B. East Jerusalem disappeared years ago. It was annexed already in 1967. And in fact, without getting into it too much, there is already one state in this, in this country. Uh, the whole idea of two states is not only gone and dead and over and eliminated by Israel, but there is today one state 
in this country, and it's an apartheid regime. So the question really is, how does Israel maintain a, an apartheid regime? After the fall of apartheid in South Africa, we all expected that would be the last time we saw apartheid. And not only maintain it, but in fact, even though there, I feel there's a change in public opinion in terms of the Israel-Palestine conflict, the BDS movement in particular uh, shows that there's, there's quite a bit of grassroots uh, resistance to that. Nevertheless, kind of where it counts, in the corridors of power, among governments, Israel's status has never been better and improves daily. And one of the most, uh, um, I think, telling uh, expressions of that is um, the fact that four or five years ago, Israel was elected a member of the OECD, which is the club of the most advanced world's economies. 25 of the most advanced economies, including Canada, and with that, you can imagine 25 of the world's most educated populations, 25 probably of the world's most liberal populations, countries, of course, that talk about human rights all the time, especially Scandinavia and many of these other countries. And yet Israel was not only elected, but to be elected to the OECD has to be unanimous. So, every, so we're talking about Ireland. I mean, there's no country more pro-Palestinian on the surface than Ireland. You have to talk, you have to explain to the Irish what occupation means. You know, Norway with its uh, uh, Nobel Peace Prize and its commitment to human rights. I mean, you can go state by state pretty much in Europe. And yet, not to mention the United States, but that's not a surprise, I suppose. Um, and yet, Israel was elected unanimous. There wasn't one state that stood in the way. One country could have said no. And not only that, but according to the bylaws of the OECD, a, a country has to conform to human rights conventions as a condition for becoming a member. So not only are they rewarding Israel, but in a sense trampling the rules that they've made themselves. And these are the most advanced economies. So the question is why? What's going on here? What explains that? And the usual suspects, the usual explanations didn't really do it. You have APAC. Well, APAC has some clout in the United States. The Jewish community might have some clout in Canada, but it doesn't explain Europe. It doesn't explain why China and India have become actually very supportive of Israel over the last years. You know, you hear about the Christian Zionists. I mean, you had your Harper, who was, a, who was an avowed Christian Zionist. And that certainly has some traction in the U.S. with the Republicans in particular. But that doesn't explain European support for Israel. Um, guilt over the Holocaust. Well, that does play a role in Germany. Germany has what it calls a special relationship with Israel. But that doesn't explain Canada. I don't think the Holocaust motivates Canadian foreign policy in particular. So all those explanations play a role in particular places, but they don't explain Israel's global um, presence, its success in maintaining the occupation and maintaining its international status internationally. So as I was casting around for what that elephant in the room might be, what is it that we're not seeing, that we're not talking about, that, that can explain this globally? Of course, uh, the issue of arms and control and security kind of hits you in the face when you begin to think about it. So instead of looking down at the occupation, which you also have to do to understand how Israel acquires, acquires this uh, uh, capability, when you look up into the world, all of a sudden, a whole different perspective comes about, not only of Israel, but of what I call security politics. We don't take, a, and I think Judy said that in terms of the environmental movement, but I think overall in the left, 
we don't really take militarism, the military security policing into account. It's not on our agenda. You know, once in a while you'll have a demonstration against a drone, or certainly there were demonstrations in 2003 against Iraq, the invasion of Iraq, but basically the military security police, maybe with Ferguson, um, is not a very common thing on the left. It's not an issue that we talk about on the left. Uh, and yet, you know, if you take, and I'll talk about that in a minute, the military and homeland security, all your domestic security agencies, and policing together, because they all make up one package today, globally, that amounts to a two and a half trillion dollar a year industry. And once you get into that, it doesn't matter if it's Canadian dollars or American dollars. <laughs> two and a half trillion. And I, as an activist, never do anything about it. I mean, I wrote a book about something I know nothing about, which is, which may, is interesting to do. But I said to myself, how can I be an activist and I want to make the world a better place and engage in issues, and I don't know anything about a two and a half trillion dollar year industry that's got to have fundamental impact on societies and conflicts and economies and human welfare, well-being all over the world. Not to mention, of course, the technologies of control that I don't know anything about. I couldn't tell you a tank from a howitzer. I'm not interested in the military. What do I know about weapons? But there's a problem there. Because, because if we don't know the technologies that are ranged against us and what the capabilities of the ruling classes uh, are, um, we're not going to have very effective strategies of resistance. So we can do our little demonstrations and do our teach-ins and everything else, but we're faced, and you know what? We don't know much about that world. I'll talk about it in a little, in a little while. I still don't know too much, but I, I'm getting a little bit of a, of a grasp of it. Um, partly because I think the left, and I'm, I'm, I know uh, I'm overgeneralizing, and Jim will forgive me too, but most people, most of us on the left come from the humanities or the social sciences. We're not hard scientists. So we don't really know. I mean, there are a few among us, of course. Um, maybe some more in, I mean, this is science for peace, so you get, uh, you know, and, and, and Bruce and so on. I mean, there are more that, that know more. But overall, I think one reason why these issues aren't more prominent on the agenda of, of the left is that most of us don't know these technologies. Um, it's not part of our world. And so, in a sense, I think we're really, um, it's a huge blind spot on our map. Um, so, as you look up, uh, first of all, you get a, a, you, Israel certainly takes on a different, uh, you know, instead of a little country, I mean, you couldn't even compare it probably to, I don't know what you compare it to in, 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 in Canada. It's the size of New Jersey. A country the size of New Jersey you know, is, it turns out, depending on what year and how you count, the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh largest arms exporter in the world. Uh, with ties all over the world. Um, <clears throat> and it's a part, and, and, the, and the, the, it, this is all a part of what I call security politics. You know, you have normal international relations. And you think about interests of countries, you know, Kissinger used to say countries don't have friends, they have interests. And so you look at what are the interests and who's against who and what camps are they in and what ideologies do they have and so on. Um, but without factoring in the security part of it, the military part of it, you really don't understand this dark underbelly of, um, of how that affects international relations. Uh, I define security politics as how a country like Israel, tiny Israel, parleys its military prowess into political clout. So you begin to see, if, now Israel for me was a very useful vehicle 
for, for tracing out security politics in the world because it's, it is a little country. It has to scramble. The Ministry of Defense in Israel has a, has a strategy, I write about it, that's called, uh, that's called niche filling. You, see, you know, Israel can't build F-35s and battleships and these huge platforms of, of conventional war like the United States can, for example, or Europe to some degree. It, it, it's a small country. And so it has to survey the world what the elites need. And elites aren't only state elites. They're also non-state actors that are, that, are, that are crucial. And sometimes even uh, mafias or criminal gangs get supplied uh, uh, by Israel. You survey the world and you see what are the niches. What are the needs of elites all over the world in order that they, that they have to be filled so that they can stay in power? And you target strategically your, your production of weapons and weapons components and strategies of control uh, and tactics and surveillance systems and security systems to fill those niches so that you become indispensable. Or at least as a quid pro quo, we'll deliver for you. We will help you stay in power. We will deliver for you. And then in return, you give us a pass on the occupation. You can criticize us. That's not a problem it, within certain limits. But when the crunch comes, you don't sanction, uh, sanction us. So that, um, so that this is sort of a map of Israel's security politics. And, and you could see, begin to see how it works. It, it certainly isn't uh, uh, thorough. I mean, Israel has relations with 130 countries that we know of. I didn't put 130 arrows, uh, and uh, and many that we don't know of. And then, of course, they're they're very, they're very uh, complex. These connections, because you get this issue of dual use, it's hard to see how much um, military security export Israel has, because it's all you don't even have that category uh, when you look at the statistics on Israeli exports, because it's all. It's all enfolded into technology, high tech, you see. So if the same, your same GPS system that gets you around town when you want to find something is exactly the system in, 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 uh, in fighter airplanes that guide pilots and missiles to their targets. So is GPS a military technology or a civilian technology? You see, when you get into dual technologies, you, you begin to understand how these things uh, work together. So, okay, there's a quid pro quo here. You can see that Israel has strong relations to North America, the United States in particular, of course. Um, in 2008, Bush approved $30 billion for Israel in, in a cutting edge weaponry, over a 10-year period, between 2008 and 2018. Now, Obama, just a week ago, approved a $37 billion package to Israel over the next 10-year period, 2018 to 2028. And I don't know if this news trickled in, in here, but when that was announced, $37 billion, for a country the size of New Jersey, 83 senators, we're talking about 83 out of 100 senators, uh, sent a letter to Obama saying no. That is not enough. Israel should get $45 billion over the next 10 years. And that, of course, it's complex, I, and I talk about it in the book, but that's not just, you know, doesn't it Israel gets $45 billion and puts it in its pocket? Of course, a lot of that is a subsidy to the American defense industry. So when you're really talking about how does Israel get away with it in terms of lobbying, the American defense industry is a much stronger lobby in Washington for Israel, not to mention Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states and Egypt and so on, than APAC is. 
The American defense uh, industries together have a lobbying budget seven times larger than APEC. So in some ways, you don't even need APEC when you're talking about a, 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 a golden egg of 37 to $45 billion that you're giving to one particular country. And that's only one country within the wider Middle East. The largest customer of American arms, of course, is Saudi Arabia. So, <clears throat> so, you, have, so you, know, you have that relationship. But not only that, in most of the cases where the, uh, where the Americans give military aid, um, it's a subsidy to the American defense industry. Israel is an exception in that only 70% has to be uh, has to be spent in the United States. 30% of 30, 37, 45 billion dollars can be invested in the Israeli defense industry in order to develop its own capacities. Now, its own capacities are prodigi prodigious. Uh, one is when I was here last time in Canada, I spoke at several universities because there's a campaign here of BDS against the Technion. And the ties to the Technion, which is Israel's largest polytechnic university, and really the largest laboratory of the Israeli army, with ties to many, many Canadian universities, among others in the world. So that, so that, um, so that you have that aspect of it. But Israel has then uh, the, the ability to, it has privileged access so it's not only able to develop its own technologies through the Technion and so on, but it has privileged access to American, Canadian, and European technologies as well that it integrates into its weapons programs. So that you really have um, a, not only a matter of subsidizing the Israeli arms industry, but really giving it that knowledge and the access to knowledge that allows it to develop uh, immensely, and I'll talk about that in one second, what that also means. So you've got that. Of course, Israel is very close to Europe of, a, a, as well. There's what's called the Horizon 2020 program, where the, uh, that's the EU's major research and development funds. And Israel, in a speci and dual technology, uh, a, a number of years ago, was purposely expanded by the EU in order to, to take in more military companies because there's, there's restrictions, both legal and in terms of public opinion in Europe, about subsidizing military research, especially Israeli military research. And so the, and so the strategy became in the EU to, to widen the, uh, the circle of dual, uh, of dual uh, technologies in order to, to, uh, to fund military technologies, but under the guise of dual technology. So, for example, and Israel gets more research and development funding from Europe than any other country outside of Europe. And one of the projects that Israel is working on, and you can go country by country and, and, uh, and see the different projects, but with Europe, it's the watchkeeper drone. Israel is developing Europe, the EU's a, a drone that was picked. Elbit Systems, the Israeli drone, was chosen by Europe over the American Predator, Predator and, uh, and Reaper drones. Um, so Israel, of course, has strong ties to Europe and NATO. Israel's not a member of NATO yet, but it's in the neighborhood of NATO. Its weapon systems are interoperative with NATO, and you have a lot of NATO exercises in the Mediterranean with Israel. So the global north is very much tied into Israel. Okay. But countries don't have friends. They have interests, right? Now, if you're in, uh, well, if, you're, if you ask your MP, why do you support Israel the way you do? Or your government, for that matter. The answer partly is, well, Israel's one of our most loyal, is our most loyal ally in the Middle East. The Americans say, we love Israel. We share moral values with Israel. We're, you know, we're, we're both democracies. Uh, we love each other. 
Okay, okay, okay. And then you look at the map. And what, what is interesting here is, look, Israel, it turns out, is the second, third, fourth, depending on the year, arms exported to China. Whoa, China is the arch enemy of the United States, not the enemy, the arch rival of the United States. The Americans are moving their whole sixth fleet into the Pacific to contain China. Just at the beginning of this week, the Chinese government denied the U.S. Navy the right to port, to, to dock in Hong Kong. Not to mention the fact that China owns the United States. So here you've got, really, its arch rival being supplied, number two arms supplier is its most loyal ally, Israel. And what's it supplying China with? American military technology. I mean, because Israel doesn't build huge jet fighters and, and, uh, and, and, and battleships. You know, if Israel was number two and it produced these expensive weapon systems, all right, that would, ex but, but Israel's exports are really small. They're high-tech components, their security systems, their electronic systems, radar systems, navigation systems. If you can sell that kind of equipment, and still be number two to the largest military in the world, whoa, that means your penetration has to be really major. And of course, Israeli tech, you can't separate Israeli technology from American technologies. So, the, so in a sense, the, you know, the Americans are allowing Israel 30% of the billions to develop its own uh, defense industry that it then exports to its major rival. And we're talking about Putin and, and, and Russia being number one with the whole Cold War that's beginning between the United States and Russia. And we saw it in Bruce's film, uh, you know, the, uh, coming out of that part of the world. And here, Israel and Russia are the two major arms suppliers to China. Not only that, but we all know the BRICS countries that are the made, these strong emergent economies that will overtake the European Amer North American economies within the next 20 or 30 years. They're challenging Euro-American hegemony. The BRICS countries, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, that actually meet. I mean, they have summit meetings. They know that they're a bloc. And you can add to that now another group of countries that are called the Mint countries that have joined BRICS. The mint countries are Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey. And if you take those, the, that block of countries that's challenging Euro-American hegemony, Israel is super strong in every single one of those countries. It's probably stronger than the United States. Well, certainly in, if I, you think about it, in every one of those countries. Maybe Turkey a little, no, well, Turkey it's very strong, but Turkey's a part of NATO. So that, so that Israel isn't putting all its eggs into the American European basket or the American basket with all the, all the help it gets. Uh, and so Israel's very strong in India. It's the second, third, uh, fourth largest uh, um, arms exporter and security to, to, to India. Um, Brazil is very strong, and an Israeli company got the contract to, um, to uh, secure the Olympics that are coming up, uh, uh, to sec secure the Olympics in, uh, in, in Brazil. And I, I am not going to go country by country. And then you've got the global south, the poorer countries. You know, um, <clears throat> I would argue it's a little provocative, but I would argue that Israel, little Israel, has more global reach in military security policing than the United States does, which sounds crazy. The, United, the Pentagon's budget is a trillion dollars a year. The U.S. has military bases in 174 countries. But the American presence is wide, but it's fairly shallow. 
You know, it's, it's military. So you've got bases, which are kind of closed McDonald's lands. You know, and then you fly out of the base, you sail out of the base. But the impact on the local society uh, isn't always very great. Israel, doesn't, Israel has two bases abroad. And what's interesting is they're both in Muslim countries. One in Eritrea, in islands off Eritrea, and the others that are very significant are in Azerbaijan. And that's significant because that's the jumping off point to Iran, of course. Otherwise, it has no military bases. But Israel, we know, has military dealings with 130 countries, and some countries the United States has never heard of, like Equatorial Guiana that has the reputation of being the worst of the worst in Africa. But not only military, because Israel will also train your presidential guard and your special operations forces and your security forces and your police forces. So Israel has a very strong police security presence in Canada. You know probably most of you, it's been talked about, recently, the Canada-Israel Public Safety Agreement. Public safety is security and policing. It isn't military. So Israel has a special access through in the, from the days of Stockwell Day, a special access to your prisons, your border controls, uh, your, the Royal Mounted, the, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, um, um, all kinds of public safety sectors in Canada, not to mention, of course, the United States and, and, uh, and other countries. So, <clears throat> so Israel has that, and then, it, uh, like I said, the police as well. So in the United States, there are several centers in the United States that take thousands of American law enforcement officials and bring them to Israel for training, and the other way around. And what came out of Ferguson and that, one of the things that was so dramatic was that the Ferguson police, the St. Louis County police, were trained in Israel. So that you had, when Ferguson was happening, you know, the people of Gaza were SMSing, were texting the people of Ferguson. Now, how do you deal with tear gas? How do you deal with police? So the ties, the ties are there. So when you look at the, at the map, at the world in that sense, all of a sudden, you, the relationships begin to emerge that you would never have expected. You know, just one example I'll give you, Israel and Saudi Arabia. I mean, from a normal international relations point of view, what countries could be more dissimilar, more really enemies? I mean, Saudi Arabia, the mother of, of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. But, first of all, Israel politically has come out has come out uh, uh, explicitly on the side of the Sunni in the, in the war against the Shias. So Israel's on the side of the Sunni, which is the side of Saudi Arabia. Of course, they have common interests. Iran, Israel, from Israel's point of view, even more Hezbollah. Uh, and of course, they all, they're all concerned, including Egypt, because now there's an e Egyptian-Saudi uh, uh, warming. Um, they're all concerned about another Arab Spring or, you know, the outbreak of democracy somewhere or the threats to the conservative Arab regimes. So there's a lot that holds them together. So that just in the last week or two, there's been a lot of reports coming out of Israel of how close Israel has become it, it, to Saudi Arabia to the point where, you know, I think if you go back... I'm not going to get into this whole thing. But the Saudi Peace Initiative of 2002, which, which was, was the Peace Initiative of the Arab League, um, that, that was rejected, rejected by Israel. Israel. If, if you, you read, read the, the subtext, subtext, it really is an invitation to Israel to become the regional hegemon. It says, we will not only make peace with you if you give up the occupation, we, the entire Arab League, but we will integrate you into the region. And of course, the fact that the Israel is close to the Americans and it has the military prowess that it has is, is you know, it, it can deliver. So today, in the last couple of weeks, the, the Israeli-Saudi detente is happening. The same offer is on the table without giving up the occupation. 
Saudi Arabia and the Arab League are willing to 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 even uh, even talk about uh, diplomatic relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel, even without the end of the occupation. That would never happen if it hadn't been for the military uh, ties that the, that those countries have. So we have to plug this uh, this in. But there's another level as well, and that is capitalism. In other words, you could go country by country and explain the quid pro quo. That's actually not very difficult. What's more, what's more important, and this is what relates more to what I think Bruce was talking about, is that this is, you know, this is happening really within the context of, of global capitalism. So that as global capitalism enters into more and more crisis, as uh, resources become more scarce, um, you know, there's a whole, um, you know, uh, concept Michael Clare writes about resource wars. The wars today are to a large degree not over ideologies or whatever, they're over resources. And you have especially a whole belt, a wide belt along the equator where you have some of the world's most valuable resources, timber, water, uh, minerals, oil, gas, that are under the feet of the most, uh, of the poorest people. You remember the bumper sticker from the first Iraq war, how did our oil get under their sand? And that's exactly the equation. So that you've got a situation now where two thirds of humanity have been, have been categorized by corporations as surplus humanity. They're written off. They'll never be educated to a meaningful degree. They'll never be productive in the capitalist sense of the word, contributing to the, to the global economy. And the worst sin is they'll never be consumers, much beyond a subsistence level. Who needs them? They're surplus, and they're written off. So as you, but not their resources. So as more and more people get written off, including your kids, middle-class kids. That's what the Occupy movement was really about. So this isn't only happening in the Global South. The Global South is coming into the Global North, of course. Um, and as the income disparities widen, Oxfam came out with a report a month ago that actually 1% of the world's population owns half the world's resources. And as this all happens, the capitalist system has to become more repressive. There's more and more challenge. People don't get marginalized, exploited, um, impoverished voluntarily. So you begin to have resistance and challenges, and that's where the nice Ronald McDonald face of capitalism begins to melt away. And you begin to see that, in fact, um, there's technology, the technologies we're, we're beginning to develop today, um, what I call technologies of pacification in fact, are coming to enforce, enforce global capitalism. And that's a whole issue we haven't looked at very much, the left. How global capitalism as a world system enforces its hegemony at a time when there's more and more resistance. And that kind of enforcement is what generals call war amongst the people. That's the new paradigm of warfare. In other words, when you think of war, you're really thinking of interstate wars. But they